It's um, certainly a pleasure to be here today with everyone. Uh, it's uh, my honor to be able to have this opportunity to speak with you and talk to you about some of the things that we're dealing with um, in the United States in, in specific, but also um, internationally as well. I was asked to kind of talk about this from a non-potato perspective and more of a, uh, of a general produce or horticulture perspective in terms of our generations and our, um, and our demographics that are changing. But first, a little bit about me. Um, I, grew up, I grew up in West Texas. It's a very similar um, farm that you would see out there. It's dry, it's flat. This, the little prickly thing in front, that's actually a tree. Um, that's called a mesquite tree. That's pretty much the biggest tree we would have on our farm. Um, and if you got down to some of the little lower areas, you might get, they might grow about 15 feet tall. It was not a very hospitable part of the world. It blew a lot and it was very hot in the summer, a lot of sandstorms, and in the wintertime it was hot and windy as well. And there's about a week in between of each season that made it kind of nice. Great people though. Um, so you always have to say it's great people. But anyway, so I, I went to school and um, I said, I'm getting out of agriculture and I, I'm running. I wanted to be a banker or a lawyer or something like that in, in uh, Austin or Dallas or somewhere nice and did not want to go back to West Texas to our farms and our ranches and um, took off to school. Um, spent, had a, a wonderful experience in, in school, and then um, one day I got a call from a uh, professor, and he said, hey, do you want to take my ag cooperatives class? And I said, ah, sure, I've got extra time, and it changed my life. And I really had this opportunity, and, and I would, Ed Smith was a professor um, at the time, and he convinced me that agriculture was a great place to work and, and be a part of, and that this whole idea of growers being able to come together and do something that no other industry in the United States could do by collectively marketing their products was really intriguing to me. So it launched me into the ag industry. Shortly thereafter, I got a job in California, and it, this was in the late 1980s, so you remember the show Baywatch. Um, that's where I thought I was going. I thought it was gonna be like this, Beaches and Pamela Anderson and all that. I ended up in a little a place like, looked more like this called Bakersfield, California. It reminded me a whole lot of West Texas, except there was mountains on each side of it, um, still a lot of sand, not a, not a lot of water. But it was a great experience. I was in the t uh, cotton industry for 10 years. Um, then uh, in about 2000, I got into the dried fruit and nuts and eventually into the produce industry right about the same time. 2005, I bought my first farm that I owned um, that, was, that had nothing to do with my family. I bought an almond farm at the time and developed it over the years, put some horse barns on it and all these fun things. And just about the time we're getting ready to start harvesting cherries, this is actually when we were picking this year was our first commercial crop. First year, I didn't pay more money on my farm than, than I actually made. Um, but it barely broke even. But anyway, it was um, about the time we were getting ready to this, um, I merged a citrus company in with our uh, stone fruit company. And we didn't need two bosses of one company, so I said, if you want to take this over to my friend, um, you can run this, and I'm going to go play with potatoes. And that's what got me to Denver. So very quickly after this, I ended up um, back into the marketing and advertising and promotion side of the business as opposed to the production and sales and, and, um, and packing side of the business. So today what we're going to talk about is this general shift in demographics, and it's very, it, it, it just aligns very well with the first speaker's presentation in terms of what's going on, not only within the agriculture industry and attracting people to our industry, but actually attracting consumers to our industry. One of the biggest problems we have in the food industry is that we, are, we, are, we forget that the people that are really the, the major drivers of our economy today are not us. It's the people that are younger than us, people that think differently than us. They view themselves differently than us, but we're still marketing to them in the same way that we've mar we marketed to us, to our own selves um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So we're going to talk about this, and I, I don't want to delineate it ex exactly by age because that, that doesn't really work too well when you're talking about marketing, but um, it's more about a, an attitude and a feeling because this millennial feeling and their, their persona and how they view themselves is not limited to this them. It's also just to them. It's also the Generation Z, the kids that are in school today. It bleeds over into Generation X, my generation, and even into the baby boomers to some degree. So it's, it's a little broader than just an age demographic. It's more of a a personal belief, a philosophy, uh, and all the other things that are a little softer than just an age or a number. So what are we, what's the environment look like at retail today? Um, well, essentially, as, as we all know, we're offering consumers a tremendous assortment of, of options to buy in the produce department. There are over um, 1,400 PLUs in the produce department today. The average consumer in the United States walks into the grocery store maybe thinking about buying four or six different items in the produce department, but we're offering them this wide range of things um, in bulk and in package and in consumer packs and everything else. So it even expands beyond these numbers. They have, it's, it's almost overwhelming. And certainly for some generations, it is overwhelming. 
It's a conflicted decision-making process. They don't really know a lot about a lot of the products. I will guarantee you that 80% of what uh, we know is 20% is more than what 20% of anyone that walks into the grocery store knows. And of the 20% of the people that are actually halfway educated about um, produce, that are, they're buying produce in the grocery stores, about 15% of those are probably us, and the other percent, really, they don't know that much at all. It's the, but it's changing, and it's changing rapidly. This group, for some of the people that this is overwhelming and too big, they're just like, gosh, I just want to buy a salad. I don't want to buy a, a prescription for my life. They're, this is that older generation. They're the ones that are confused, but they're, that's changing very rapidly. But we have to be cognizant of this because it is a very important part of what we're dealing with and who we're selling our products to. In some cases, they think that they've got post-traumatic shopping disorder. They, they just are overwhelmed with it, and there's just so many options, they don't know what to do. But those are not the people who are driving decisions in marketing, advertising, and selling um, today. Those were, what, those were the people that were driving decisions that we were all worried about five years ago or 10 years ago, and we really can't get too well overwhelmed with that because that's not where the future is. In lettuce, um, the, the leafy greens category, there's 19 different PLUs for lettuce alone, and that doesn't include any of the things that are like lettuce, like um, collards or, um, or dandelion greens, mustard greens, um, kale, spinach. Uh, you look at spinach, uh, there's a recent uh, nutritional research project done that says that spinach, if you have enough spinach in your diet, it'll stop your mental decline by 11%. It's like, wow, this is a big thing for consumers today. If they can tie in a health and nutritional benefit to something that they already like or something that they don't know about, it creates, it creates interest and it creates conversation. So it's like, Popeye, wow, you knew what you're talking about all along. We should have all been eating spinach. Probably knew a little bit about olive oil, too. Um, <laughs> yeah, think about that. <laughs> Today's consumer, today's gen generation that we're actually after, they want these choices. They grew up with choices. They grew up with 1,400 PLUs in their lives. They understand this. It's what they expect. They're not scared of it. They're not overwhelmed of it. In fact, they want to know more. They don't only want it to see that there are 1,400 different options in produce. They want to see, they want to know what, everything about it. They want to share that information with their friends. And even though this picture up here shows them sharing it face to face, that's pretty rare. They're usually sharing it through their social networks on digital media, through their phones or through their tablets. And, they're sh and it goes fast. It's super fast how quickly this information gets around. If they like something or if they don't know what something's about, they want information. They want to have verification of what they think. So I'm not going to go through this, but this is a great infographic that I like. There's a couple of key points on here. This is about specifically the millennial generation. And, and researchers, as researchers are, they get all over the board. And whether it's 18 to 32 or 19 to 36, as this one says, it's essentially that group of people that are, coming, are just finishing school, getting into the workforce, and starting families. So that's what you call a millennials. In this group, it's 19 to 36. The important thing here is it's 75.7 million people in the United States alone. That is the largest generation today in the United States, and it's getting comparatively speaking larger and larger every day. And the reason that is is because the baby boomers are passing away at, at a rate of about 3,000 people per day, and they're leaving the workforce and retiring at a rate of about 10,000 people a day in the United States. Rapid changes in the United States like nothing that we've ever seen since the baby boomers came into the workforce, um, and it's changing everything we're doing in terms of marketing and advertising and brand development. They already control about $1.7 trillion um, in terms of economic activity. And I'll skip the rest of this, but down here on the right, you look at the values that are important to this group as compared to the baby boomers and the older generations. The things that are most important to this group are happiness, passion, diversity, sharing, and discovery. These are feelings. These are, these are, these are way, way different than the previous generations. Baby boomers, on the other hand, justice, integrity, family, practicality, and duty. Practicality doesn't even come into a, a millennial's mindset hardly. Uh, it, it, just, it just doesn't matter. I mean, what, why am I worried about practicality? <laughs> it has nothing to do with me. It is so different, and it's, and it's what's shifting this so quickly. This is Generation Z. If you like gener the millennials, Generation Z is just awesome. It is going to be the most fun generation to market to we've ever had. Um, it, this is, these are the kids that are in school right now. Um, and the really cool thing about this is unlike my generation or, or most of your generation, um, they actually have a big say in what they're, what pe what's going on in an economic, uh, in the economic decision-making process at the store. They actually tell their parents what they want, or they tell their grandparents what they want. Another big trend in the United States is the merging of generations back 
from a single or from two generation mother, father, son, daughter, or whatever to grandparents coming back into the homes for whatever reasons, either economic reasons or social reasons, whatever it is, they're all, this is coming back. And the, the kids are telling them what they want. Now, when I was growing up, my mom never once, I think, ever asked me what, she, what I wanted her to buy at the grocery store. I was out playing or school or whatever, and I would come home and I would eat what the heck she had on the table or I wouldn't eat. That was life. It is totally different today. I mean, today you can go out and you can actually have an economic impact in marketing to kids that are eight years old and having them influence their parents and grandparents and what they're buying at the store. Totally different world today. Another point I wanted to bring up real quick is on, the, on this very bottom part, there's, there's a circle to the left that says agree 77%. I believe business should be, make doing good a central part of their business and not just by giving to charity. This is coming from kids who are 18 and under. 18 and under, they're thinking this way. And if you don't think this is going to change how we go, to, how we go about our business in agriculture and in any other commodity, you're, you're not paying attention to what's happening right now. Millennial generation started this. It, it's the social connectivity. We talked a little bit about it in my presentations yesterday. It's how important it is to this, these, new gen, these younger generations and that, you, it's that what your business is is about something more than just making money, just more than just selling a strawberry to me. It's more than just selling lettuce to me. It's what you're going to do with that money once I give you my money and buy your food, because I'll buy my food. But if I really want to be a part of your business and really want to support you and, and talk about you and tell, you, tell you about your company and your products to all my friends and all my big network, I need to know you're doing something more with that. That a part of what you're doing is actively engaged in solving the world's problems. It doesn't have to be a, a problem in Africa or Asia or somewhere else. It can be a problem in my backyard. It can be a problem that I know about in, in the hungry people and poor people in my neighborhood that you're actually engaging with and you're, you're working with. If you can create that social connectivity, it, it puts you at a whole different level in terms of respect and, and, um, and transparency with this next these next two generations. Really going to be important. If you've heard of Tom's Shoes, uh, I, it's a company in the United States, a guy that um, went over to Africa. He noticed that a lot of people in Africa didn't have shoes. He decided he was going to create a shoe company, came back to the United States, creates a shoe company, and he says, hey, if you'll buy my shoes, for every pair of shoes you buy, I will also send a pair of shoes to someone in Africa and make sure that they have shoes to put on their feet. And this company went from nothing to one of the largest shoe manufacturing companies in the United States in a matter of uh, five years. And it's not because his shoes are great. I mean, his shoes are kind of pretty much, are not exactly all attractive. They're pretty cheaply made shoes. They're made for, you know, for specific designs. It's getting better now. But it was the social interaction that the consumers really attached themselves to. And they, they thought, okay, I'm not only buying myself a, a pair of shoes, I'm also buying someone else a pair of shoes that don't have shoes today. And that's the type of example that you have to get your mind around in terms of creating new brands and new images for your companies. Um, now, again, this, this is just to show, how, this is not a, 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 an American trend. If you look over here, the second group to the right is North America. This shows the difference between um, people that are 64 and older versus people who are 15 and younger. And if you think that things are happening fast in the United States, globally it's unbelievable. 19% um, of people in the United States are under 15. 14% are under uh, or over 64. Africa, Latin America, the rest of the world, vastly different. In Africa, you now have 41% of all people are under the age of 15. If you think things are going to change there, it's, just, it's unbelievable what's about to happen in Africa and some of these other markets. And it's going to change everything we do in the food industry as we try to, to serve these people and, and feed these, these, this mass group of people that are starting to explode. If, I, I did not put this chart in here, but the, normally the next chart I would show is talking about what this means um, 75 or 100 years from now. By 2100, Africa will be the largest population base in the world, larger than Asia, 4.8 million versus about 4.7 million people. It's shifting. It's totally changing. Likewise, in the United States, they're expecting us to go from about 350 million to about 700 million. We are going to be so outnumbered um, by people in Africa and Asia in the, in the next 75 years. It's, it's just mind-boggling. Whoops, went the wrong way. Let's see here. Okay. So again, it's not all about youth, however. Um, you know, we talked about this earlier. It's more about attitude and perception and, uh, and adapting to what these generations are doing. Um, but this is just internet usage in the United States. 18 to 29, essentially everyone who is in the millennial group uses the internet. Um, almost the same with, the, with Generation X. 
Baby boomers, it's up 88%, 57%. Why is this important? Because this is how you connect with them. It's not through magazines, it's not through television ads, it's not through radio, it's not through billboards anymore. It's through digital media. It's through interactive digital media and their networks that they speak with. The great thing about this, this, this segment, the, these demographics, food is tremendously important, much more important to, the, to this group in these younger ages than it was to the um, Generation X and the baby boomers. I mean, sure, food was important. We have to eat. We have to survive. But all, everything about food is much more important to these generations. Um, the millennials, Gen Zs, they, they talk in terms of being adventurous with their food, of experimenting, trying new recipes. Um, they, want, they want fresh. I mean, for anyone who's in the fresh market, this is, is a big opportunity for you. Um, and they like, to, they like to eat at restaurants because restaurants is where, are where they're actually learning and, and engaging and finding new ideas because restaurants are kind of the leading edge of, of where they go. And, and then the other thing that we already talked about is that they're, they're very um, adventurous in their cooking. They want to try new things, be creative, and, um, and, and have fun with their food. And as we mentioned earlier, they want more information. They're not scared of information. They want you to tell them not only that, that you're growing a, a tomato, but how you're growing your tomato. What are you putting on your tomatoes? And it's okay if you put chemicals on your tomatoes. Just tell me why you're doing it. And tell me it, and make sure it's safe for me. I don't, want to, I, don't want, I, mean, I don't have to have organic, but I want to make sure that I'm not eating something that's, that's not safe and that I understand why you're doing it. It's okay if you're, if you're using Roundup to spray weeds as long as I know that Roundup's safe and, and it, it comes off my, my tomato. I understand that that's better than, than putting 50 people into, an or, into a field and, and weeding um, the field by hand. I can understand that and get my, hand around, my, my arms around this. The relationship with food and the consumer is also changing quickly. It's, a, it's becoming a more social part of their lives, um, not only in the restaurant, but also at home. This is a way they connect with their friends, they bring people in. It's an inexpensive experience part of their life. And experiences are much more important for these generations um, than, than, past ex than past generations. They don't really care to buy things. They want to buy the life experiences. They want to experience it. They want to take photos of it. They want to take video of it with their friends. They want to share those experiences with everyone and then go on to the next thing. It's a, it's a big difference than, than, uh, than previous generations. Also, this is where they kind of express their creativity. In a lot of our consumer panels that we do research with, uh, recipes and ideas and creative thoughts of how you can actually um, prepare the foods that they're buying from us, this is a very important part of it, is how I take it home, how do I be creative with it, and how do I show off my creativity, either directly with my friends and family or through Pinterest or Instagram or 20 other different um, social media apps that they can, they can share with. All these things give them a sense of well-being and, and excitement. Again, I mentioned earlier that restaurant leads trends. This is, this is very current information. Um, this is what's going on in the United States right now in 2015. These are the top 10 things or, uh, that are go there we're seeing in restaurants and food service. And around the top is environmental sustainability. What are you doing on your farms? How you're growing your food? What are you doing to assure that, that this farm will survive for the next 100 years and we'll be able to continue feeding the population as the population grows? Things like that. Natural ingredients. Hyper-local sourcing, this, is, this came out of nowhere in the last couple, year or two. Um, it, it used to be good enough that the chef was buying their foods from a local farmer's market, and then it was kind of really cool and trendy to actually have a relationship with a local farmer who was delivering to different restaurants in the community. Now, they actually want to have a tiny little garden at their restaurant that they can grow their herbs and other things and put them right into their meals in that restaurant. And that's kind of a, the new, cool, really fun thing in, in restaurants in the United States. The photograph here that I actually used to, as an example, I love this. It's just showing a new way to use something that's really simple. They're apples and oranges that have been sliced up and put back into a vaguely round shape. Um, and it's being t and someone's taking a picture of it with an iPhone and putting it on Instagram or wherever and sending it out to the world talking about, hey, isn't this cool? This is how you reach um, consumers today. So what, when we're dealing with this, you know, we've gone through all kinds of trends, Tex-Mex, um, Indian food, Ethiopian, you name it. What's happening now in the United States are restaurants are starting to just smash all these together. So they're getting Ethiopian, um, Caribbean uh, flavors coming together and mixing them up and coming up with new cuisines that are combined, combining these things. And it's just an example of how geography boundaries are being eliminated by the Internet and by social technology. 
this, is, this whole thing is changing what restaurants are doing, and it's also going to change what consumers want. So if you think they're going to want less choices, no way. They're going to want to continue to have more choices, new ideas, new packaging, new ways to bring food home and, and into their lives. Another big thing that's happening in the States is food trucks are becoming mainstream. Um, ten years ago, a food truck was essentially something that would go to farm workers or to factory workers or, or other areas where they needed cheap, fast food that they didn't have time to go or enough money to go to a restaurant at lunch, and, um, and, and it was a, served a really good purpose. That kind of evolved into a, a situation where chefs that were really creative and they thought, well, I don't have enough money to open up a restaurant, but I do have enough money to rent or buy a truck and save up enough money to buy a restaurant. And so once they saved up enough money, they would sell the truck and then they'd have their restaurant. Now we're seeing that evolution change a little bit further and you're actually seeing this as a business model and they're not selling it. it. The restaurant is the food truck and they keep that and that is their main form of operation. They may add even extra food trucks or they may even license out and franchise food trucks to other people who like their model. Um, it's a rapidly changing um, part of it. It's one of the fastest growing sectors um, in, in the food service industry in the United States. So now we have to look at all this and, and what does all of this mean in terms of branding and marketing and, and approaching to millennials? Well, millennials um, view themselves differently than, 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 we, than they view us. Um, they really do believe they're different. And, the, and if you look at the very top part, the blue part of this, they're talking about you know, modern, spoiled, lazy, risk-taking, hip, funny, self-centered. These are all I, uh, terminology that millennials uh, actually explain about themselves. It's not us saying what we think about them. And you just have to be aware of this when you're creating brands and you're creating packaging for your products. If this is the group that's really driving the future of food, driving the future of our economies, whether it's food or anything else, even though not everyone is a millennial, this is what people are focusing on, and this is where they're going with it. So why should anyone pay attention to you and your brand? And this is a big question we all have to ask ourselves in this day is, why am I important? Why are my cherries from my farm important to this demographic? And I'm trying to figure that out just like everyone else. It's hard to reach out. Uh, this, we are all surrounded by messages and information and technology on a daily basis. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this is coming at us. We never have our phones turned off unless we're asleep. And even when we're asleep, half of us leave them on in case something important comes up, which I don't know what's important enough to wake you up, but, but it could be. Uh, the, the, you know, email, I mean, my gosh, how many emails do you delete every day just looking at the heading? or the title. You just delete them, get rid of them. And if, you, and if you're doing it, think about someone who is 25 years old and getting four times the amount of email messages. They are, they're putting every kind of spam filter they can on this to eliminate the, the gray noise in their lives. Multi-screen, multitasking, everything's going at, at warp speed. You've got to figure out how to be relevant in, in this world. And it's not, you don't create relevance by adding more clutter with the existing clutter out there. You just have to, you got to figure out what's special, what's different. You have to fight clutter with relevance. You have to figure out how am I relevant to someone who's 28, 27, 24 years old, um, believes that it's better to share a car than to buy a car, believes it's better to um, rent uh, a hotel room from, from a non-hotel company like Airbnb than go to a Marriott or, or a Hilton or something. There's share, it's a sharing economy, a different way of looking at things. And I, and I mentioned Airbnb, um, I'm not gonna go real deep into that. Airbnb, if, if you haven't heard about it, it is the largest um, hospitality company in the world. Largest hospitality company in the world. More rooms than anyone in the world. They don't own a single room. They rent everyone else's rooms out. And if you haven't looked at it, go online, look up airbnb.com. It's at every single country, every single city around the world has a place where you can rent a room from someone who, who owns a house, an apartment, or something else. On my farm, I actually have a 900 square foot um, studio apartment attached to my shop that was pretty much a wasted space until I figured out I could list it on Airbnb. And I rent that out probably about 75% of the days a year right now. People come in, they want to they stay on a farm. $100 a night plus um, a pet fee if someone brings a pet with them. And they can walk around the farm, they can touch the horses, they, they can look at the cherry trees or whatever they want to do. Point is, there are, this generation is much more apt to, to buy into things like that. It's relevant to them. They don't really want to buy a hotel room from a Marriott for $150 when they can go and get an experience on a farm in Sanger, California. One other point here, made you look, you, you know, it's, it's an acronym we're saying, okay, any advertising or, or any press was good press. That is not true anymore. 
Any press is not good. You can get really bad negative press a day that will absolutely drive you into a hole very quickly. You've got to stay on top of it. You've got to make people care now. You can't just make them look at you. You got to figure out how am I, how am I going to make people care about my business and my, and my, my products. So how do you do this? Um, I'm not going to go real deep into this, but this is, I would encourage you to look at this concept. It's called programmatic marketing. It's new. It's only, they've only been talking about programmatic marketing for, for a couple of years now. Um, but this year, 2015, they, in the United States, 55% of all ad dollars, all promotional dollars will be spent in programmatic marketing activities. A year ago, I didn't even know what this term was. It wasn't even on my radar. But it is all about intent targeting of a person or a consumer or a potential consumer. It is your customer on the micro level. And there are, there are systems out there and there are companies out there that are doing this. These are some of them um, here on the right. These are companies that are buying data and figuring out who is your customer today. And an example of, this would, of, of what this would not be would be like Ford Motor Company running 400 different television ads acro uh, across the year. And they're advertising to everyone in this room whether you're interested in buying a car or in, in much less whether you're interested in buying a Ford. And they're doing it just to keep their brand recognition going, which it's a very traditional way of advertising and marketing. Today, a dealership in one single city of a Ford dealership can actually target market someone who's driving down the road and happened to buy a Ford sometime in their past, and they have a car that's maybe eight years old now, may, may be ready to buy a new car. As they're driving down the road, they can see they're within a mile of their dealership. They can send them stra straight to their, their cell phone and say, hey, listen, I, if you'll stop by the Ford, our Ford dealership that's only a mile from you right now, we'll give you $50 to come in and say hello to us. And if you want to buy a car from us, we're going to give you 1000 bucks For a little tiny bit of money, they can target someone who's on the edge of buying a car. Very small. This is something that you can do. You don't have to be a giant company to be able to target your customers today. You can figure out who your customers are, target them with your product, with your story, and give, convince them to come to you. I'm going to leave you with one, other, one little final thought. This is a beautiful picture of some potatoes. It, it's rustic. It's natural. It shows a little bit of dirt sprinkled down at the bottom of the ground in, in, a, in a jute bag. This came from an advertisement that has been used in the past. I took all the words and everything off just because that wasn't necessary. Great imagery. Beautiful photo. Absolutely not the way to market to today's consumer. Absolutely not the way you're going to go after the millennials. They are not going to, uh, that, that means nothing to them. It really doesn't. This, however, does. I have now shown them a way to use the product that I'm trying to sell that, that's new. It's a little bit different. Hey, it's still a potato. It's still roughly in the same form. It's been spiral cut, had a, had a, a very healthy sauce poured on top of it, roasted and ready to go. This is how you market to the millennials. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Really happy.